Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd ask you if you could please take your seats. We're going to try to get the proceedings underway so that we are on time. If we could please close the doors, please. I'd like to welcome you to the Chamber of Commerce Legislative Luncheon. I'm Will Pinot, the CEO of the Chamber, and I'll serve as the Master of Ceremonies. It's my honor to acknowledge the dignitaries joining us this afternoon. Your Excellency, the Governor, Martin Roper, the Honorable Wayne Panton, Premier and Minister for Sustainability and Climate Resiliency, the Honorable Anthony Smelly, the Chief Justice, the Honorable Makiva Bush, Speaker of Parliament, the Honorable Franz Manderson, the Deputy Premier, the Honorable Bernie Bush, Minister for, for Home Affairs, Youth, Sports, Culture, and Heritage, the Honorable Kenneth Bryant, Minister of Tourism and Transport, the Honorable Johnny Ebanks, Minister for Planning, the Honorable Sabrina Turner, Minister for Health and Wellness, the Honorable Andre Ebanks, Minister for Financial Services and Commerce and Innovation, Investment and Social Development, the Honorable Samuel Bulgin, the Attorney General, Mrs. Catherine Ebanks Wilkes, Parliamentary Secretary, Mr. Isaac Rankin, Parliamentary Secretary, Ms. Heather Bodden, Parliamentary Secretary, the Honorable Roy McTaggart, Leader of the Opposition, Ms. Barbara Conley, Member of the House of Parliament, Mr. David White, Member of the House of Parliament, Chief Officers, Heads of Departments, Statutory Authorities, and government companies and members of boards, councils, and committees, Chamber President Michael Gibbs, Chamber Executive and Council members, Chamber Past Presidents, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. Put your hands together. I have received apologies from the following individuals as well, the Honorable Chris Saunders, the Deputy Premier, the Honorable Juliana O'Connor Conley, Minister of District Administration and Education, the Honorable Alden McLaughlin, the, Mr. Joseph Hugh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition, and Mr. Dwayne Seymour, Member of Parliament. While lunch is served, I'd like to move ahead with the first presentation. Oh, I'm sorry, my, my mistake. I would like to invite Samuel Rose, if he's with us. Mr. Rose? Maybe he's arriving now. There he is, right on time. See, you queued, queued right at the right time, Sam. He'll lead us in the blessing for this afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let's bow our heads as we pray this afternoon. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity for us to gather here together today as a community, Lord. We thank you again for your many blessings to the Cayman Islands. We thank you, Lord, for sparing us through the ravages of the global pandemic, which even allows us now to gather this afternoon for this very special occasion. As we look around, even within our region, and recognize the, the turmoil and upheaval in our neighbor, Haiti, Lord. We just have more reasons to be thankful to you, Lord, for our peace, democracy, and for the safety and organization in which our country operates and functions. So we ask you to bless this food to our bodies, bless this time of fellowship, and help us to be truly thankful for our blessings. In Christ's name we pray, amen. DART is our proud luncheon partner, and we'd like to thank them for their ongoing sponsorship of this event and other chamber programs and events. Jackie Doak is the president of business development at DART, where she directs the development and execution of DART's local and international business development strategy. Jackie and her team are responsible for developing the business community at Kamana Bay, a hub of professional and financial services 
and working in partnership with private and public entities to promote the jurisdiction overseas. For more than 17 years, Jackie has been involved in creating exceptional places and experiences with DART. Her experience in commercial and residential real estate, knowledge of the corporate offshore industry, and talent for building mutually beneficial relationships makes Jackie a natural advocate for living and doing business in the Cayman Islands. Please welcome Jackie. Thank you, Will, for that introduction and good afternoon. With protocol being established on behalf of the DART Company, we are pleased to be here with you today at the Legislative Luncheon. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. For us at DART, this personifies what we have done and what we continue to do. We focus on today while also looking ahead for the needs of the future. So I'd like to share a story about a company, a company that chose to relocate its family offices in 1993 to the Cayman Islands, which is now our global headquarters. And over the years, our real estate development portfolio has grown, grown globally. We include a large range of asset classes, including hospitality, retail, residential, and office. Here in the Cayman Islands, we have invested in excess of US 1.5 billion, and outside of Cayman, we have invested more than US 2.3 billion in gateway locations such as London, New York, Houston, Orlando, and Washington, DC. I'm now gonna take you back in time, actually 25 years ago, to 1996 when we were master planning Kamana Bay, which at the time was known as the West Indian Club. Ken Dart had the vision for a town that would blossom and become a community, a gathering place for people that would also reinforce Cayman's position as a world leader in financial services. This vision resulted in a multi-generational commitment to the economic, social, and environmental sustainability of the Cayman Islands. Back then, we undertook an economic assessment almost two decades before the National Conservation Law as we all, DART, Department of Planning, and the Department of Environment understood then and understood now the importance of balancing and, condition and considering all aspects of sustainable development. The environmental assessment report looked at the impact on water quality, terrestrial habitat, mangrove habitat, shallow marine resources, and socioeconomic implications. And over a two-year period of intensive planning and research, we met with multiple focus groups, including the civil service, the statutory authorities, utility companies, the National Trust, industry, bo industry bodies, and residents of the Cayman Islands. And as a result, we agreed the framework and development intent for Kamana Bay through master planning of a phased development over a minimum of 10 to 20 years, which then received planning approval. When we look at our flagship Kamana Bay, you see that we do what we say we will do. We planted the trees more than two decades ago, creating a nursery where we continue to propagate plants, many local and indigenous species that are seen on our properties, in our parks, and in the landscape medians on the roads. They add character, provide shade, and comfort while paying homage to our heritage. And this is Kamana Bay today. The extent of our development, which is aligned with our development plan, aligned with the growth of Grand Cayman, and aligned with market demands. And Kamana Bay represents four pillars of sustainability which exist throughout all of our developments. Land stewardship, smart design, outdoor spaces, and renewable energy, all of which require holistic long-term planning. 
Kamana Bay was envisioned and is now a town where life blossoms. And it is clear that in the last 25 years, we have proven that our development tent is multi-generational, that we are committed to sustainable development, and that we do not develop simply for short-term profit. If we were merely in pursuit of short-term profit, we would have joined in the line of condominiums that are along Seven Mile Beach, especially in those times of demand that we are seeing, just building and flipping, building and flipping. But we did not do that. The only development that we have undertaken on Seven Mile Beach is where you are today, the Kimpton Seafire Resort and Spa and the residences of Seafire. This is a development that is aligned with climate resiliency, with deep setbacks, elevation, and open spaces. A property that is an economic engine that contributed millions of dollars in tourism accommodation tax to the government and will continue to do so when our borders reopen. And we are not an insular developer focusing only on our lands. Instead, we collaborate with our community, the private sector, and government to ensure current and future infrastructure needs are met. With public-private partnerships such as the NRA agreement, we have invested in road infrastructure to alleviate traffic congestion, starting with the Harkwell Bypass that became the Esterly Tibbetts Highway, extended that to Badham New, and now the Airport Connector Road. We participated in the expansion of the airport runway, and DART is leading a consortium of local and international experts to deliver the government's vision for a sustainable solid waste solution, Regen. The Cayman International School has seen two expansions since it opened in 2006, with a capacity for over 1,000 students. And we welcome Fosters at Kamana Bay. We sold lands for the expansion of healthcare with Health City Cayman, and to the north, Med City, Aster Med City. What, am I, what I am speaking to you about today is bigger than DART as a real estate developer. We are not just a developer in the Cayman Islands. We are committed to the sustainability of these islands. At DART, we believe that an environmental management framework would help balance the company's environmental, social, and economic interests by providing a clearer roadmap for sustainable development that aligns with the existing goals of future existing and future legislation, such as the National Development Plan and the National Conservation Law. On one end of the spectrum, there are lands and habitats which are highly sensitive. And these habitats are of, are of significant environmental importance, which absolutely must be protected. And at the other end of the spectrum, there are lands which, if developed, have the opportunity to provide the greatest economic benefits to the country. In the middle, where the value is not as clearly defined, having such a framework would be invaluable to guide the decision making. A comprehensive environmental management framework informed by all stakeholders that reflects a shared vision for the future would provide clear guidance on how land can be developed, managed, and protected, and give much needed certainty and clarity to both conservation groups and landowners. The current lack of clarity not only leads to uncertainty, it has created unnecessarily polarization in the community. Our perspective is that the division seems more intense than it actually is, when ultimately the majority of the community is seeking the same broad outcomes of sustainable development for the Cayman Islands. And part of the sustainability is economic resiliency. We have been an economic driver in recessionary times, such as in 2008 after the global financial crisis. We focus on resiliency and recovery to address the shocks that impact our islands from time to time, like Hurricane Ivan and COVID. And during COVID, we formed and funded the R3 Foundation for Recovery, Relief, and Resiliency. We also provided financial contribution to government for critical supplies as well as logistical support. And like most businesses, we have been negatively impacted by the financial implications of the pandemic, especially in the hospitality sector. However, we, re we remain committed with a long-term perspective to see this through. Plant a tree now 
and you can be sure someone will sit in its shade when it is fully grown. This also speaks to the investment DART has made in our people and our future leaders. Our investment in the Cayman International School plays a role in planting the seedlings of our country's future workforce. We have mapped our investment activities to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And consistent with this, we are launching the Sustainable Development Goal Challenge throughout the high schools so our future leaders can share their thoughts and insight on which development goals they believe the country should invest in. They have an important voice. And our educational programs and community initiatives like Minds Inspired, DART Scholars, DART Grant, and WorkX, these educational opportunities are bearing fruit, produ producing meaningful contributions to our society. On your screen, you will see Julian Solomon and Kelsey McLean, who are two shining examples of the same, and now are with us full time at DART. After all you have heard today about DART's commitment and contribution to the Cayman Islands, actually not just heard, but experienced in some way over the last 25 years, we often hear the question, who are we developing for? And while that is a very good question, the question we ask ourselves at DART is who are we investing in? DART's business investments and activities are investments in Cayman's future, providing opportunities for shared prosperity. Shared prosperity for all of us in this room, for our children, our grandchildren, their grandchildren, and future generations. We are investing in tourism, the visitors who come to our shores, and financial services, the business community that thrives in the environment that the Cayman Islands has created and sustained. We are investing in emerging industries such as technology and film. And we are investing in our communities and our people. We know that we are a small yet powerful group of islands with amazing people. Collectively, we need to continue to work together to find solutions to national issues that cannot be addressed by government or the private sector alone. Poverty, crime, education, healthcare, infrastructure, climate change, the environment, and yes, sustainable development. Caymanians have always embraced those who have come to their islands and contributed to its well-being. And for that, we are grateful as it has created a diverse melting pot that has made Cayman successful. In the 90s, Mark Vandeveld, our CEO, and Ken Dart, our managing director at the time, shared Ken Dart's vision for the town of Kamana Bay. Over the last 25 years, that vision has become a reality. We are proud that our global company is headquartered in the Cayman Islands. We are owned by a Caymanian, led by a Caymanian board, we have over 600 Caymanians that work with us. Cayman is our home, and we remain committed to the shared prosperity and the well-being of this company. As I said at the beginning, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Well, maybe after you have your lunch. So please join us in planting trees for future generations. Pick up a seedling as you leave here today and plant a tree. Make it a family event, take a picture, and share it with us and the country by tagging hashtag dark KY. And in the plant you will see a little instruction on how much sun, water it needs. And also on the back it tells you, and it also tells you the name of the plant. And on the back it reminds you that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the next best time is now. I'd also like to acknowledge Francois, who leads our nursery team, for providing us with the seedlings today. And I'd like to close by saying, we are a small island. We can make an impact. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you. I'd like to thank DART for their lunch sponsorship. They've always been a big partner with, with our event. 
and we appreciate their partnership now and ongoing. Just let's say to supplement the beautiful plants that DART is going to provide each of you during your lunch, uh, after your lunch when you leave, the chamber also has beautiful Earth Day um, bags that we'll be giving to everybody as you exit. So we just want to have that as a token of our appreciation for your support today. And then finally, on your tables, there's a pad and some pens. So after the Premier's address, we're going to invite the Premier to have a conversation with President Mike Gibbs, and then we'll also open up to some questions. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask the Premier, please write them down, and my team will collect those, and we'll see how much we can get through. Enjoy your lunch. Chamber President Michael Gibbs is the past chairman of the Insurance Managers Association of Cayman, IMAC, and is a past president and now life member of the Lions Club of Grand Cayman. Originally from London, England, President Gibbs is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants and has nearly 40 years in the offshore financial industry, of which four years were spent in Hong Kong and the balance in Cayman. After an initial assignment with Price Waterhouse, President Gibbs spent 12 years with the Bank of America in Cayman and Asia, and four years with Johnson & Higgins, now Marsh Management Services. In 1999, he was instrumental in the establishment of Kensington, which now ranks as one of the leading insurance management companies in the Cayman Islands. He retired last year from the firm as president and now serves as a consultant. Please join me in welcoming President Gibbs to the podium for his opening remarks. Thank you, Will. My life story is now out in public. <clears throat> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'd first like to begin my comments by first thanking the Governor, the Premier, members of Cabinet and Parliament, senior government officials, uh, and uh, for taking the time from your busy schedules today to participate and attend this annual Chamber Luncheon. Each year, chamber members look forward to meeting and interacting with their elected and official representatives and senior pu uh, public servants, as demonstrated by today's sold out audience. And I sincerely hope that you all find today's luncheon informative and interactive. I should at this point say more by luck than judgment, we chose this date uh, because if we'd chosen it yesterday, I'm sure the attendance, especially by the governor, would not have been quite so good. Uh, and also on Sunday, we're all gonna be cheering for football is coming home rather than going to Rome. <laughs> With all due respect to my Italian friends in the room. Anyway, on to the more serious matters. Um, are they more serious anyway? Um, as this is the, the first opportunity we've had since the election, I would also like to publicly thank the members of parliament who participated in the Chamber's candidate forums in March and April. The Chamber has been hosting these forums each election and by-election since 1988 as a non-partisan platform to provide voters with an opportunity to compare the candidates' positions on the key issues. We received very positive feedback concerning the online format of this year's forums, and I trust they help voters to decide their preferred candidates on the election day. My final expression of appreciation on behalf of Chamber members goes to the Governor, the past and present elected governments, public sector officials, and public and private healthcare professionals for keeping our islands safe during the global pandemic. Your efforts from swiftly, swiftly securing our borders to quickly obtaining a steady supply of vaccines from the UK have been truly heroic, and we will forever be grateful. Thank you for your ongoing efforts. The topic at the forefront of most chamber members' minds is the safe reopening of the borders. And this has been vigorously debated for many months. Marc Langevin, president of the Cayman Islands Tourism Association, serves on the Chamber Council. And he has been providing the council with regular updates from recent and past meetings that have taken place 
with key public and private sector stakeholders who are working to develop the plan. This is reassuring news since setting a firm date to reopen the, to stay over tourists for visitors is vitally important so that we do not miss another winter tourist season. Many stayover visitors and large incentive groups have reserved dates during the winter months but are becoming increasingly concerned that unless an a reopening date is announced very soon, they may have to cancel their reservations and travel to another jurisdiction. This would obviously be disastrous to our economy and especially to the tourism sector and the many small businesses that have struggled to survive during the past year. We are certainly aware that preparing to reopen our borders is no easy task or decision and does prevent significant challenges, but also several opportunities. Firstly, it's a perfect opportunity to recalibrate the tourism sector to attract, train and promote more Caymanians to take up satisfying and rewarding careers in this industry sector. Attracting more Caymanians to the industry will also address the common observation in DOT visitor surveys that they want to see more Caymanians interacting with them during their stay. The Ministry of Tourism, DOT, CETA, and other tourism uh, stakeholders are working diligently to provide training and incentives to attract Caymanians to the industry. Training programs and courses such as the Certified Bartender course uh, organized by Chamber Vice President Nelson Dilbert in partnership with Cayman Spirits Company and the Wine School is just one example of an innovative way that should be encouraged uh, and supported to attract Caymanians to become involved in the industry. The Chamber fully supports these efforts and congratulates all stakeholders for working to motivate and encourage more Caymanians into the tourism and hospitality sectors. Additionally, the hotels and condominiums that have undertaken extensive improvements and investments in their properties should also be recognized. The newly renovated and soon to be opened Hampton Inn, current refurbishments to the Ritz-Carlton Grand Cayman, Sunset House, the West Inn, and several condominiums will provide visitors with an updated and fresh product. These multi-million dollar investments and upgrades clearly demonstrate investor confidence and will serve us well in the coming years. But with every opportunity, there are also some challenges. The jurisdiction will need to agree on its final policy on vaccination for visitors, as well as new and current work permit holders, and determine the implications of these decisions. Many countries are not in the same position as Cayman in terms of access to vaccinations. In fact, top countries for recruitment, like Jamaica, Philippines and India are struggling to acquire vaccines, which will present some challenges when employers seek to recruit from these countries. Tourism and health officials will also need to determine the process for reconfirming records of vaccinated travelers, particularly from the US, our top destination for visitors, which has yet to confirm an authenticated process for persons who have been vaccinated. These challenges can be overcome but it will take careful planning by the government and the cooperation of the private sector to develop a policy that is reasonable and effective. We certainly look forward to the Premier's address, which I'm sure will provide us with an update on government's decisions and plans in these areas, including whether or not it will be mandatory for all work per permit holders to be vaccinated. Moving now to the Chamber's advocacy agenda, the global pandemic has reshaped economic and political agendas and priorities around the world, and the Cayman Islands is certainly no different. Last month, to better understand the issues facing the main industry sectors, the Chamber's Executive Committee invited the heads of the various industry associations for a consultative working lunch. We asked the associations to share their top issues so that the Chamber could adjust their advocacy agenda and focus on the areas of common concern. Among the top issues raised were the access to and cost of attracting qualified labor, escalating prices and access to affordable construction materials, reopening our borders, increased investment in and promotion of the financial services sector, 
overall strategy for the promotion of the jurisdiction, education reform, sustainable development, escalating land and housing prices, availability of affordable rental properties, and pension and health reform. There's certainly not enough time to address each of these areas, but I would like to offer some comments on pension and health insurance reform, the importance of the financial services sector, investment promotion, and education reform. The private pension system was launched in 1998 to kickstart retirement savings for Caymanians and residents. Up to that point, only Caymanians working in large firms or employed with the public sector had access to pension savings accounts. So most people relied on government or other investments to supplement retirement income. It was known at the time that the private pension system would take many years to build up enough money to become a true vehicle to provide full retirement coverage, particularly for persons who joined the system in the latter years of their employment. Last year's pension withdrawal demonstrated the success of the system, with nearly half a billion dollars being readily accessible by the members of the various plans. The withdrawals provided much needed supplemental income for many persons who were facing economic challenges as a result of the pandemic and a much needed boost to our local economy. The withdrawals have, however, placed the Cayman Islands in a challenging position of determining what measures to enact to replace the money that was withdrawn. Last month, the Chamber's Executive Committee met with a group of pension plan providers to discuss this situation. They presented a series of recommendations that the cha Chamber plans to share with the Minister for consideration. For many years, private pension reform has been necessary and advocated by the administrators. And it is therefore hoped that the current situation will lead to some practical decisions to revise the national pensions law and regulations, as well as the investment guidelines, so that the pension system can be reshaped to achieve its intended purpose of providing meaningful retirement income when it's most needed. Moving now to health insurance, the escalating cost and limited choice of health insurance providers is creating significant duress in the private sector and especially among persons who have reached or are approaching retirement age. Last week, a Chamber small business member reported that their premiums had increased by more than 50% year on year. That increase for 12 employees reportedly added $100,000 in additional cost to that business this year alone. And that increase is compounded by previous increases year on year. This is obviously unsustainable. You truly know the system is not working when persons who have contributed the best years of their working life must decide whether they can retire in Cayman or have to move to another jurisdiction because they can't afford the health insurance plan. The Chamber plans to meet with the Minister responsible and the industry stakeholders so that we can work together to hopefully develop some reasonable solutions to address this very serious matter. Turning now to financial services. The financial services sector is one of the key pillars of our economy, but during the pandemic, it became our main pillar. If it was not for this sector, it is likely that we'd have had to have made the decision to reopen our borders much sooner before we achieved the vaccination levels we have today, which is what has occurred in several countries in the regions whose economies are based primarily on tourism. It is therefore important that our islands take a closer look at how we invest in the sector and what we are doing to address the misinformation that exists in the international area of public opinion. During last week's first meeting with the Minister of Financial Services and Commerce, the Honourable Andre Ebanks, we raised the matter of providing additional funds to support the promotion of the sector and developing a public-private partnership similar to other competitor domiciles, and that would allocate sufficient resources, expertise, and funding so we're in a position to proactively promote and defend the industry. During recent meetings with Cayman Finance, we learned that competing jurisdictions invest millions of dollars in promotion and lobbying in order to protect and grow the industry sector. We therefore look forward to working with the minister and are encouraged by his initial supportive comments. 
On the subject of sustainable development, sustainable development, sustainable investment is what it's, it says here. <clears throat> Later this year, the Chamber will be sending a delegation, we hope, to the World Chambers Congress in November in Dubai. We will join chambers from around the world that gather every two years to share best practices to promote their jur jurisdictions. This year's uh, conference coincides with the World Expo, which is also being hosted in Dubai between October 2021 and March 2022. The United Kingdom will be setting up a pavilion, which we understand that the Cayman, Cayman Islands can be part of. This is a great opportunity to promote the Cayman Islands and the brand Cayman and Invest Cayman concepts to the world. Chamber representatives and other business leaders attended focus groups for the brand Cayman concept, and we look forward to seeing the final version unveiled and working with government in this undertaking. Education reform featured prominently during the recent election campaign. Nearly all candidates mentioned some aspect of education reform in their manifestos and during public meetings. Education is often regarded as a political football that is tossed from administration to administration with differences of opinion on what needs to be improved or changed to ensure that, cha that students possess the skills that are required to become productive contributors in the workforce or entrepreneurs who start their own businesses. The Chamber will be organizing an education summit later this year, which we hope will generate an open and frank conversation and exchange of views between educators and employers on what needs to take place to bridge the gap between the world of work and classroom, so that our students are prepared and ready to fill the jobs and business opportunities of the future. We intend to meet with the Minister soon to discuss the event and seek her support and partnership. Establishing a working partnership with the new government is one of the Chamber's main priorities. I wrote to the Premier in May congratulating him, uh, him and his new government on the election and seeking to establish quarterly meetings so that we can work together in partnership to address some of the issues that I've mentioned. We received a positive response and the Chamber's Executive Committee looks forward to the first meeting. Obviously at times we may have differences of opinion but it's important to meet and to discuss and debate options for taking our islands forward. The Chamber is pleased with our track record of working with successive governments on various initiatives, from the establishment of the island's first employee counselling service for businesses, the Employee Assistance Program, the, cre the creation of Cayman Crime Stoppers, the island's first multi-employer pension plan, the island's first mentoring program in the schools, the island's first teacher uh, appreciation awards program, the Golden Apple Awards, our small business workshops, trade missions to Panama and other countries, the Earth Day cleanups and Cayman Clean ca campaign, this annual legislative luncheon, and the annual economic forum. Each of these initiatives has been achieved in partnership with various government ministries and departments. Earlier this year, we met with the Deputy Governor and he updated us on his goals and progress towards developing a world-class civil service. The Chamber committed to assist in any way, and in that regard, we have just concluded a public sector performance survey, and we'll be sharing the results with the Deputy Governor shortly. So, in closing, we stand ready and willing to work with the new government as we develop strategies to achieve continued success for all residences and residences, all residents and businesses that call Cayman home. Thank you for your attention. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed Premier, the Honourable G. Wayne Panton, JP MP. Premier, uh, served in Parliament as a member for Bodentown and as a Cabinet Minister from 2013 to 2017. Following the 2021 election, he was re-elected as a Member of Parliament for Newlands and was sworn in as Premier on Wednesday, the 21st of April, 2021. Mr. Panton was born in the Cayman Islands and grew up in Newlands, Grand Cayman. He attended Cayman Prep School and subsequently what was then the Cayman Islands High School. 
Following graduation from sixth form, he attended the Cayman Islands Law School and joined the firm of W.S. Walker & Co., obviously now Walkers, as an article clerk. After qualifying in 1988, he joined Walkers as a corporate and trust associate. Mr. Panton became a partner in Walkers in January 1997. During a period of very significant growth, uh, he had been a member of the firm's three-member management committee, the deputy managing partner, managing partner of the firm's international structured and asset finance practice, and chairman of the Walkers Group until his retirement in June 2011. He has been active in several professional, civic, district, and community organizations, as well as statutory authorities. He was president of the Caymanian Bar Association, chairman of the Port Authority of the Cayman Islands, vice chairman of the National Trust for the Cayman Islands, and a member for the Government Shipping Sector Consultative Committee. Mr. Panton grew up on the water, so loves the sea and has logged many miles of open ocean fishing and traveling. His love for the outdoors is also reflected in such diverse interests as diving and flying. He resides in Newlands with his wife, Jane. Please join me in welcoming our premier. Amazing group of wonderful people. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> President Mike, thank you for the introduction. Um, if you had just called my name, I would have come up. It could have saved you <laughs> the time and effort. And uh, I'd like to congratulate CEO Will. I'm not sure. I've lost track of where he is right now, but um, somewhere around for uh, the, passing the endurance test of dealing with the, the protocol requirements. I think um, you'll find that my remarks bear a lot of alignment with the comments and remarks from um, President Mike in relation to the Chamber's programs and initiatives. And I think um, that is a, a very positive reflection of the engagement and the involvement of the Chamber and uh, the various um, members and businesses that are, that are involved. And I, I'd like to congratulate Jackie on a very good presentation as well, so, so ably done. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure if it's, um, if it's by design or by accident, but I'm sure there's a, an incredible commitment behind um, the approach that you have reflected in terms of the dark groups approach to sustainable development and Certainly a lot of the a lot of the businesses in Cayman I think have recognized the the interest and, and value in that um, Just very quickly. I want to say um, one uh, matter in relation to protocol um, I have been asked by my colleague um, the Honorable Bernie Bush um, to give apologies. He wasn't able to make it because he had a, a pressing engagement on a ministry matter. So, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the members of parliament who make up the government, it is my pleasure to address the Chamber of Commerce today at what has become a very well attended business event. Uh, for those of you listening and viewing remotely, thank you as well for your interest and attention. Thank you again to um, President Mike and CEO Will for the, the invitation and the opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, over the past 16 months, uh, we have been on a remarkable journey as a people and a community. Many of us faced periods of great uncertainty as we worried about keeping ourselves and our loved ones safe from COVID-19. Travel restrictions kept us separated from family and friends 
We adopted social distancing, we adjusted to wearing face masks, and through restrictions on gatherings. And we were prevented from supporting each other at weddings, birthdays, and funerals. And some of you had to face the frightening peril of losing your life's work, your businesses, your companies. You struggled to support employees both here and overseas. You adjusted, innovated, created, and drew in the very ingenuity and drive that made you entrepreneurs in the first place. Some of you had to take out loans or sell assets to keep your businesses afloat. Others ran skeleton, skeletal teams, and some, the unfortunate ones, were forced to close the doors of your businesses. This government would like to pay tribute to the business community for your collective efforts to keep persons employed, keep your doors open, and to maintain your confidence in the Cayman Islands. As you rallied around various community groups to help the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. During the past 16 months, there have been many private sector examples of generosity, service, sacrifice, and resilience. Too numerous to list. But this government applauds you for helping to keep our economy buoyant and confidence in the jurisdiction at an all-time high. Our collective commitment as a community to put people first and the private sector's adherence to the myriad COVID regulations meant that we are one of the few countries in the world that has effectively contained COVID-19, making the Cayman Islands one of the most attractive places to visit, to work, and to live. Despite the sacrifice and resilience of the private sector, we couldn't ignore the fact that COVID-19 lay bare the fragility of our social constructs, nor could we ignore the deep fissures in healthcare coverage while some of our social support systems cracked under the volume of new clients. The pandemic magnified the dramatic inequalities that had lain hidden underneath the statistics of record-breaking economic growth and opulent prosperity. The pandemic exposed the two parallel realities that were both came on. So ladies and gentlemen, it was against this backdrop that I resolved to stand for election and in the course of campaigning, witness firsthand the passion, grit and determination of the individuals who would later become my colleagues in forming a new government. Despite all that has been said, at, at the time we were forming the government and in the two uh, and a half months since, I am proud to say that the ministers and parliamentary secretaries and I are all strongly aligned on our purpose, our vision for a better Cayman, and our values. Thank you. We are here to responsibly improve the quality of life for this and future generations of Caymanians. Broadly speaking, our vision is of a Cayman Islands that is held up as one of the most sustainable countries in the world. A trio of islands where all its citizens can thrive. A peaceful and prosperous place known for its resourcefulness, all its, di its diligence, its excellence, and its innovativeness. The members of parliament and I who form the government are, on the face of it, a diverse and disparate group, each from different industries bringing different perspectives. Yet we are in unanimous agreement about the values that will guide our decision making. The four values that make up the PACT acronym, people driven, accountable, competent, and transparent. Each member of my government has pledged to be driven by and to be held accountable to these guiding values when making individual and collective decisions for the people of the Cayman Islands. These values constantly come into play whether we're discussing, discussing education, new technologies, health care, the elderly and the indigent, all facets of government and life. We need a new way of doing things that will give us new opportunities for our people to succeed. The current model has some broken parts. We need to change how business is done. 
On the campaign trail, we spoke independently, but once we formed the government, we came together to find that we essentially wanted many of the same better outcomes for the citizens of this country. People-driven, accountable, competent, transparent. These values, our guiding principles, have helped us align our objectives and shape policies, and helped when it came time to make the tough decisions on resource allocations. Despite the wishful thinking of our critics, we are evolving into a team with a shared vision and a clear sense of purpose for our beloved Cayman Islands. Community creates country was my group's slogan on the campaign trail, and it underscores our philosophy. One cannot underestimate the impact that, has, that is made and the momentum that is created when individuals in their communities throughout the islands come together in their own neighborhoods, working to help their neighbors and care for their districts. These seemingly small acts and demonstrations of community spirit by separate groups all combi combine to create a strong, united country that is heavily invested in the well-being and future of all its citizens. There are thousands of people in this country who live on the edge of poverty. One household bill away from not having enough money to pay the mortgage or the rent or electricity bill. Many face mental health challenges and there are hundreds of people, Caymanians, who live in substandard housing conditions with no chance of improving their situation because rents outpace their earnings. Across all ministries, we share a commitment to putting social development, the health and wellness, wellness of our society, and the ability for our people to develop their full potential at the center of our decision making. Our vision for Cayman includes you as a business community. And we hope you will all join us as we commit to putting a sustainable community and country first. Each of us, whether industry, business, or individual, acts solely Sorry, if each of us, whether industry, business, or individual, acts solely and consistently in our own narrow self-interest, then we will accelerate inequality, delay or derail our ability to thrive as a community, and in turn sabotage true sustainability between our people, our planet, and our prosperity. Timing on the applause, thank you. <laughs> it is no good for a select few to feast if the vast majority suffer famine. The climate crisis, increasing cost of fuel, the increasing traffic congestion, pressures of de development on critical natural habitat, loss of indigenous flora and fauna. Um, I'm sure, Jackie, that tree is an indigenous tree, right? Perfect. Stony coral tissue loss disease and increased hurricane activity are all very real challenges that we face, all issues that we are finding solutions to address. If we're to make progress in achieving long-term development goals, we must address sustainable development. Climate change is not a standalone issue and its inherent risk must be integrated into all aspects of development planning. We must begin with the recognition of our vulnerability and challenges, and yes, even opportunities for growth. To quote outgoing CARICOM Secretary General Erwin LaRocque, the Caribbean region is subject to a double vulnerability from external economic shocks and national or natural natural disasters, sorry. The islands of the Caribbean community see sustainable development as an urgent necessity rather than a politically, politically correct slogan for the future. We must align our goals with CARICOM and the United Nations through a national sustainability and resilience action plan. 
My government and I believe that tackling sustainable development is the only real pathway to increased long-term prosperity. Investing in natural capital will increase efficiencies and contribute to our island's success. We will foster innovation, attract the right investment, and increase access to additional markets, including renewable energy and ecotourism. These are ways we can help diversify our economy. Through increased efficiencies, we can create self-sustaining wealth for the economy, the environment, and the social development for the people of our islands. We need to grow green, in short. I marvel at the way the private sector is leading the way on climate change, but a partnership with the government is required to make significant change. Paul Pullman, the former CEO of Unilever and founder of Imagine, says that alliances amongst businesses are growing. He chaired the board of the International Chamber of Commerce and noted in an interview last June that at that time, some 22 chapters of the chamber were putting climate targets in place and signing up to initiatives ranging from gender balance and fighting discrimination um, and pledging to buy sustainably. He said, and I quote, we cannot go on to operate in silos and expect to find answers. It gives us some improvement, but not at the scale and speed that we need. It is just incremental improvement, whereas what we now really need is a step change. I appreciate the efforts of, the, of our own Chamber of Commerce to focus attention on littering and its impact on the Cayman Islands environment, tourism products, and communities. So with, with climate change uppermost in my mind, my government supported, supported me in establishing a Ministry of Sustainability and Climate Resiliency, which includes responsibility for revising the National Development Plan. I believe this is long overdue, and I promise you that it will be one of the key focuses of my administration. Development is a driver of our domestic economy. And I know we were all relieved when construction was able to begin again as COVID restrictions were lifted. Before I go further, I want to make it abundantly clear that despite the chorus from critics, neither I nor my government are averse to or enemies of development. Quite the contrary. We simply have to achieve the right balance. We need to reimagine how we do things. We must encourage and promote good stewardship of our natural resources and environment and the use of well thought out design and materials that benefit everyone. We know that we need to invest in infrastructure and affordable housing and address the concerns of young Caymanians in relation to the cost of home ownership, which is fast, in, from their perspective, becoming beyond their reach. We're also aware of some of the very real concerns of many in the construction industry, especially as they relate to rising costs and limited access to materials. We too feel the pressures of the global trade war between China and the United States, but in many cases, production and supply chains have been impacted by the pandemic. We are carefully looking at ways to ensure that the cost of construction materials um, could come down, and we're reviewing duties and incentives for sustainable, sustainable and client-conscious developments. You will have seen that we have appointed a new central planning authority. I thank the outgoing members of the CPA for their service. I also thank the new chairman, Ian Pardew, and the new CPA members for putting themselves forward for national service. It is by no means an easy job. In the same way that the National Conservation Council meetings are held in public, we want to see CPA meetings also be made public unless there are very good reasons not to do so, having to do with data protection or commercially sensitive material. We believe that demystifying the work of the CPA will be to everyone's benefit. One surprising finding when we took office was the absence of data 
to help inform decision making. Data is central to our vision. We have found that our country operates with a remarkable lack of data critical to decision making across all three pillars of sustainability, the economy, the society, and the environment. Simply put, better data means better decisions and thereby better outcomes. As business people and industry leaders, you appreciate the strategic importance of data to manage performance and inform decision making. This weakness in government is one that our elected officials and civil servants are working to rectify. But here again, we need your help in gathering up-to-date and factual information. Part of, the information, of that information sharing will come in October when we embark on Census 2021. As you know, the census was put on hold last year because of COVID. I am grateful that our successful handling of the pandemic is allowing us to proceed with the census this year. The success of Census 2021 requires the successful completion of the data, sorry, of the, of the census process, and Census 2021 can only truly be successful if the results are credible and accurate. Your participation is therefore essential and will help ensure that we have accurate and complete information to inform our national decisions. Our vision also requires that we be reasonable, respectful, and balanced. Cayman can and must learn from other countries where irrational polarization, dogmatic entrenchment, tears apart families and communities. The recent, recent terrible example of what happened in Haiti must be confined to history and never to be repeated. We must be able to have differing opinions without attacking and eroding the characters of each other. We must be able to uh, be willing to listen to each other and truly seek to understand the opposing view. One of Cayman's greatest strengths is its diversity and our ability to, to coexist peacefully. It is healthy and normal for us to have differing views and opinions, but we must continue to undergird our interactions with respect for each other. Finally, an important plank in our quest for excellence is good governance. In casting their votes in April, our people demanded good governance, accountability, and transparency. That is what we've pledged to bring to our roles as elected representatives and leaders. We ask that our fellow leaders in the business community also pledge to practice good governance. In working together, we can see the Cayman Islands become the benchmark for excellence in governance. So just what does good governance look like for the private and public sectors? I'll start with my side. We believe that the people you elect to lead our country need to be held accountable. As Thomas Jefferson said, when a man assumes a public trust, he should consider himself a public property. That is a premise in which I strongly agree, and as such, we will soon be making public manuals and codes of conduct for both the cabinet and the parliament. I took responsibility in administration of 2013 to 17 to rewrite the 1995 guide to operations of the executive council, which is no longer germane, but it didn't have the support to get adopted at that time. It will, the new version will be a reflection of my government's mission and vision and as I said, these documents will be pu published for perusal by the wider community. To me, this is a serious matter, and it's a serious part of adhering to good governance and being transparent. People outside the cabinet don't know what cabinet deals with, they don't understand the standards, and this helps build a framework of the conduct they can expect from us and that we expect of ourselves. The more we can be accountable to the public, the better we are at transparency. The better we are at transparency, the better we are, will get at decision making and at resource allocation. Other governments have talked about transparency, we can demonstrate it. We can move forward and make significant inroads in dissolving public mistrust and speculation about what happens in government. We must conduct ourselves honorably I expect both my colleagues and you all to hold us to that. There is more that we can do. 
One of the things that has always bothered me about the makeup of government committees, national boards, tribunals, commissions, and other public bodies is a lack of diversity. I am glad that I'm now in a position to do something about it across the board, as it is now our policy to ensure all people are represented in these groups, including women, older persons, youth, and those who are differently abled. This shows that all people across the country are represented and that diverse views are reflected as well. Many of you in the private sector are already good at doing this. As for good governance in the private sector, I'm encouraged that, that th there are a number of businesses that I've seen and industries which have already begun to reflect this, including um, environmental, social, and governance criteria in their operations. Environmental criteria consider how a company performs as a steward of nature, while social criteria examines how it manages relationships with employees, suppliers, customers, and the communities where it operates. Governance, of course, deals with the company's leadership, executive, pay, audits, internal controls, and shareholders' rights. I had an enlightening meeting um, recently with members of the Cayman Isles Institute of Professional Accountants on this subject, um, and I think their approach represents exceptional work, so I congratulate um, their approach and their, their actions. Merely doing what is permissible under the law does not necessarily mean it's the best or the right thing to do. ESGs are an excellent place to begin when considering incorporating good governance principles in the private sector. I believe that we as a government should consider how to further support those businesses that continue to set the bar when it comes to being good corporate citizens that support Caymanian advancement and that are truly invested in Cayman's long-term success. Working towards our vision, in our first three months in office, we have focused on reviewing existing COVID-related regulations and programs to either extend or amend them as needed. We have extended programs that provide essential relief for our people who have been the most negatively impacted by the pandemic. The pension holiday was extended, as were the tourism stipend, tourism workers stipend, and the health insurance continuation program. These efforts pr continue essential support to those without jobs until our economy reopens and provides relief to businesses grappling with reduced revenues. Beyond review and, and re-implementation of COVID-related um, programs, the PAC government has focused on the day-to-day -day running of the government and attention to core public sector activities while simultaneously developing the Strategic Policy Statement, or SPS, for the next three years, as well as crafting key strategic policies for this administration. Specific examples of core government activities include the launch of the National Census, in, introduced, um, and we introduced partnership regulations regarding economic substance to avoid being on the, included in the EU's list of non-cooperative countries for tax purposes, the continuation of national road in infrastructure improvements, the addition of new national weather service um, of observation stations and ongoing work and public consultation to remediate and cap the Georgetown landfill. And we're making the Coast Guard a reality as well by producing a bill to formally establish the territory's first Coast Guard. And that bill will go to Parliament shortly where it is government's intention of having the proposal enacted later this year. No reflection of the past 16 months would be complete without an acknowledgement of the importance of financial services to this jurisdiction. Your ability to remain open for global business during the height of the lockdown while having employees working from home played a key role in keeping this economy going. Without hesitation, you too created and innovated, supported your employees, and I believe many of you learned that staff who work from home can, just, can be just as creative and productive, if not more so, uh, than being in the office. Your financial performance and government's coppers reflect that. My government recognizes the essential role of financial services to our economy. Now more than ever, we will seek to support, promote, and defend the industry as the lists of 
threats and challenges continue to grow. It is why the Cayman Islands has joined with 129 other countries and jurisdictions considered by the OECD to represent more than 90% of global GDP in the G20 OECD consensus for a framework for reform of international tax rules. The new two-pillar plan is directed at international corporate taxation rules to ensure that large multinational enterprises pay their share of tax wherever they operate. And that aligns with Cayman's long-held position that taxes should be paid where they are rightfully owed. What set financial services and many of your businesses on a sustainable path during the peak of the pandemic was the ability to provide services digitally. Being digital by default remains a critical aim of this government as well. Information and communications technologies are changing how the, pub the public sector provides services to residents, visitors, and businesses in the Cayman Islands. E-government is helping us cut costs, boost efficiency, and improve customer experience. We are replacing the poor person's relief law with modern financial assistance legislation, and the new Ministry of Investment, Innovation, and Social Development is moving forward with the National ID Program, which will transform the way in which you conduct business with government. This should roll out later or early, in the early part of next year. We also recognize that the increase in digital and online business means an entirely new set of challenges for our Royal Cayman Islands Police Service. Crime has also gone digital. And so the police services, services continually wrapping up its cyber crime resources. We vow to lend our full support to the police to ensure that Cayman re remains a strong, safe, and desirable place to live and conduct business. A strong economy must be underpin underpinned by safety and consumer confidence. So I wish to acknowledge the police service for being innovative and moving with the times. The success of business, businesses in the Cayman Islands means the success of government and our economy. That success gives businesses an opportunity to create jobs for our people, and it gives our people an opportunity to contribute to the economic well-being of the country. On economic matters, my government has reviewed and forecasted government's current and projected financial position. We can't accurately plan for the future if we don't know what the cost of our actions or inaction are. As I express thanks to the Deputy Premier and his team for our updated forecast, I think everyone in this room is thankful to the Caymanians and residents of these islands who have kept our economy going by supporting local businesses. I know many businesses would not have survived without citizens shopping locally, taking staycations, eating out, supporting charitable events, and deliberately investing in our economy. Next week, we will table the 2022-2024 Strategic Policy Statement in Parliament. That document provides medium-term economic and financial forecasts for government for the next three financial years covering the period from 1st January 2022 to 31st December 2024, along with government's broad strategic outcomes, which will guide the development and implementation of government's policy during this period. The SPS demonstrates my government's continued commitment to managing public finances responsibly. On the heels of that, my government will produce its first budget. I've taken you through our work since coming into office to build a better, different Cayman where everyone can succeed. The first step in achieving our recovery and larger, long-term goals for these islands must undoubtedly be the safe reopening of our borders and rebuilding of our economy. Key to Cayman's success story is a strong, robust, and diverse economy. We know that, and we understand that we cannot continue without unlocking our full economy. 
We also understand that we will need your help to get there. And we're asking that you work in partnership with us for the benefit of your businesses and these islands which we all call home. Everything that we do, everything that we propose is towards the betterment of the Cayman Islands as a whole. Just as the business community joined with the government in the suppression of the COVID-19 pandemic, we need you to join us in the rebuilding phase. As we prepare to reopen, let's continue to use this opportunity to build a better tourism industry and to better place Caymanians to populate this industry. I'm sorry, prepare Caymanians to populate this industry and place them. But first, we must reopen safely. And that has always been contingent on us following the science and trusting the medical advice. Let's be honest, many people had their doubts. The previous administration set out a lofty goal of burning out COVID in our community. And yes, I got the phone calls from many members of the community asking me to lend my voice to those opposed to the strict public health initiatives and measures taken. I refused to speak out because I supported the approach taken by the previous administration. But let me be clear, our government intends to reopen the economy to tourism in a safe, responsible and careful way. And I thank all of those who have contributed to helping the work of government during the ongoing pandemic. My sincere gratitude goes out to all of our healthcare professionals and public health staff at the forefront of testing and vaccinations. Indeed, we all owe a debt of gratitude to the hundreds of public servants who have worked tirelessly during this pandemic to keep our islands going. Our well-being, community health, and safety is a direct result of their professionalism, commitment, and sacrifice. Early on in our battle with the pandemic, the Cayman Islands took a conscious approach to be guided by the science, and all our decisions have been made based on scientific data and recommendations from our healthcare experts. If we want to continue to enjoy the freedom of movement and safely reopen our economy, then these are two things that we will have to do. One, meet our vaccination target. And two, continually test and monitor the existence of variants of concern that if you had watched closely around the world have the potential to reverse gains and force communities back into lockdowns. I hope that we all realize how lucky and blessed we are in the Cayman Islands and how enormously grateful every man, woman and child should be to the United Kingdom for providing us with the best vaccination that exists today for free. I first heard the expression of going from vaccination hesitancy to vaccination desperation in the context of India where there was a massive surge of COVID infection. But during discussions recently with CARICOM heads of government this week, it truly stuck, struck me how relevant that is in our regional context. Because many of our neighbors, ladies and gentlemen, are struggling to obtain access to a vaccine supply. We have truly been blessed, and thanks to the support of Public Health England and ad advocacy from our governor's office, we have continued to improve our lab facilities and, and have now taken a major step forward by acquiring the capacity to conduct genome sequencing in the Cayman Islands. That is an absolute game changer and something that we should be exceedingly proud of achieving. One particular story I pause to highlight is that of a very talented and incredible young Caymanian on the cutting edge of science, whose work is playing a seminal role in, role in leading our charge to safely reopen our borders. Mr. Jonathan Smelly 
had initially applied to be a medical intern in the emergency department at the government hospital. But his qualifications of a bachelor's in cell biology and two masters, one in medical genetics and genomics and the other in systems and synthetic biology landed him in a forensic assistant role in March 2020, less than a week before hard lockdown was instituted. While working within the lab, he developed a proposal to start next generation genome sequencing. While the genome sequencing project is focused specifically on, the, on sequencing the different strains of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, Mr. Smelly and his colleagues are actively working on implementing medical genetic testing to service the local population. And Jonathan is by no means the only Caymanian in the lab. Beverly Nunez, who started her career in forensics at the Health Services Authority in 2010 as a forensic analyst, advanced in her career and in 2019 became Cayman's first qualified female Caymanian forensic scientist. She is the acting forensic manager and quality manager for the department where she leads the forensic staff hires new staff members and ensures that everything within the department runs smoothly. I'd like to also mention two other young Caymanian female laboratory technologists, Nisha Miller and Tanisha Gilbert, who both worked in the COVID lab. They performed the important tasks of preparing the COVID samples for PCR testing and conducting tests with the gene expert machine. We're deeply grateful to these experts. And I take this opportunity to highlight the significance of the growing field of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics to our young people. Imagine for a second where we would find ourselves today had these brilliant young Caymanians been discouraged from pursuing their passion for the sciences. Some skeptics would simply say the solution is easy. Just take out a few work permits. Well, that's not a solution. The point I wish to make for our partners in tourism and across all industries in Cayman is that if we can have a Caymanian like Jonathan Smelly conduct genome sequencing, then we must be able to find Caymanians who can manage hotels, food and beverage, or lead banks. <laughs> you see, ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan and Beverly attain their great heights not only by their own grit, that for sure, but not only by that. Not only by their own determination and diligence, but because their employer, the Health Services Authority, simply didn't take the easy route and pursue work permits. In fact, they supported their ongoing studies, and today both employer and the employees have benefited. But more importantly, we as a country have benefited. This kind of successful partnership is what is critically needed in protecting the very tourism industry we also desperately wish to see reopened and restarted. I salute the Health Services Authority. I salute these amazing Caymanians. And I salute every company in Cayman, every business in Cayman, every business leader in Cayman that seeks to take that approach. Key to our economic success is maximizing Caymanian employment, both in tourism and across all sectors of our economy. We have the most opportune moment now as we begin to reopen our economy. Our government-sponsored tourism structure between the Ministry of Tourism and Transport and the Department of, Trans of Tourism has been supporting and developing our existing pool of Caymanian hospitality industry workers through the shutdown of our tourism industry. In addition to financial assistance in the form of stipends and grants, we continue to offer skills training and refresher courses for tourism-related businesses and staff. As part of our targeted efforts to prepare the local workforce for reopening, Workforce Opportunities and Residency Cayman, better known as WORC or WRC, the Ministry of Tourism, Department of Tourism, 
University College of the Cayman Islands, and the Cayman Islands Tourism Association has been collaborating on initiatives to reduce Caymanian unemployment through training for employment in the tourism industry. Work and our other tourism stakeholders will help ensure that the necessary personnel are actively working with these job seekers to secure employment. Toward the end of the summer and into the fall, work intends to launch a three-stage, three-level approach, rather, training program that will be geared to preparing Caymanian job seekers for long-term careers within the tourism industry. We are aware of the concerns of business owners that there won't be enough workers to fill available positions once the country reopens. However, we are assured that through our cross-partnership initiatives, there will be many capable Caymanians available to fill these positions. As we head into reopening, we ask of all businesses, but especially those in the tourism industry, to hire Caymanians first. You now have the time, the opportunity, and the incentive to train and nurture Caymanian talent in hospitality. We, do more, we need to do more than just pay lip service to the fact that we need to empower our own people to have the ability to share in the miracle of the Cayman Islands. Let's start now by truly training up our people so that their future, the futures of their children, will mean they will own, as well, a small piece of that miracle. It's not the lone job of government, and it's not your job singularly either. It's going to take both of us. You telling government what we need to do to help you successfully prepare our people for the workforce here at home and globally, and government giving you the abilities and tools to do that. Who knows, through the enforced hardship of the pandemic may come a glorious result. The Caymanianization of our tourism product. We have done the research and, hard, and heard time and again that visitors want to meet the locals of the country they are visiting. This is the time that we can make this go from a wish to a reality. We are realistic, however. We do recognize that we have many wonderful individuals who have been granted work permits who are a credit to our tourism product. Many of them have worked side by side with their Caymanian colleagues in the trenches and faced the hardships of COVID as well. Let me say here that we anticipate your concerns about the processing of significant volumes of work permits and the logistics of having workers come in who are not yet vaccinated, but who have agreed to be vaccinated on entry, as well as the issues around airlift considerations. We're prepared to work with you on all these issues. And we cannot talk about tourism without talking about one of our most precious resources, and that's our environment. Already the PAC government has agreed on measures to help tackle environmental problems such as the annual threat of sargassum weed in the sea and on our shorelines, stony coral tissue loss disease, critical tursing, uh, turtle nesting habitats, and invasive species regulations. Further afield, we have agreed in principle to a temporary 12-month moratorium on new wildlife interaction zone licenses. Made appointments to critical boards that oversee our environment. Uh, the Energy Health Policy Council has agreed to begin the five-year review process of the national energy policy. And I've been in discussions with Lord Ahmed, the Minister of State for the Commonwealth, about our plans to review update and adopt the draft climate change policy, which has languished for too long. As I said before, many of you know me, you know what I stand for. Protecting the environment of the Cayman Islands is one of my deep passions. If we lose that, um, I think we lose everything. And it is with our pristine environment and a vaccinated populace that we can begin welcoming visitors back vaccinated visitors back to our beautiful islands. So, ladies and gentlemen, that leads on to the reopening plan, which I'll get to in more detail shortly. But first, another goal that needs to quickly become a reality is reaching 
our vaccination numbers. I have to thank President Mike and other chamber members for backing my government's push in May to get citizens vaccinated. Working together, we achieved the goal of using our stockpile of free vaccinations before they expired. Now we need to work together again because the cornerstone of our safe reopening plan for the Cayman Islands is a high prevalence of vaccinations in our local population. You will have all seen the revised population numbers and realized that with a goal of vaccinating 80% of our population, we have a harder challenge to meet. So we're asking for your help with this too. Please, if you haven't already do done so, encourage your staff, especially all frontline members, to get vaccinated as soon as possible. We have a significant supply available courtesy of the United Kingdom. The sooner we reach our vaccination target, the sooner we'll be on our road to economic recovery from this pandemic. Toward this end, government will require proof of vaccination for both renewal and new work permits as a part of our phased reopening process. Please impress upon your existing employees on work permits that if they refuse to get vaccinated, they may no longer be able to work in the Cayman Islands. It is a critical public health issue. We must all, sorry, we must do all that we can to get as close to that 80% vaccination um, mark as possible, our optimal target, which has been advised by Public Health England. I said previously at the last government press briefing that we expect are expected to begin a phase reopening in mid-September, and this goal remains on target. I would reiterate, the key aspect of our phase, phase reopening plan is the safety of our population. We want to avoid people becoming seriously ill, or even worse, dying. As a country, we have done everything possible to avoid this so far, and we must continue in this effort. It is for this reason, to keep our people safe, that we have decided on a phased approach to reopening. Chief Medical Officer, Officer Dr. Lee, Dr. John Lee is working with, country, with countries to ensure that we are able to verify their vaccines just as we do now with our own Health Services Authority and the United Kingdom. Again, our main effort is to keep you and our community safe. We have to guarantee that the people we let into the country and who say they have been vaccinated and can be verified as such. I add that as we begin relax, to relax uh, restrictions in the move to reopen borders, we must acknowledge this presents a, a slight increase in risk. And the latest advice from Dr. Lee is to urge the elderly and vulnerable to consider wearing masks indoors. This reopening plan I'm presenting to you first today is our country's best case scenario. Our goal is to locally manage the risk of transmission and prevent individuals from becoming seriously ill by maximizing vac vaccination rates and continued surveillance testing through each phase. I will take you broadly through each phase of the reopening plan now, but rest assured that government will continue its ongoing national communications campaign to announce clearly when things are happening and what it means for our community. Our plan is a phased approach, as I said, which allows assessment at each phase. Assessments based on the medical science and data. And this will be used to progress or change our plans. Transition between phases will be determined by the Chief Medical Officer's assessment of tourism source, source markets, by prevalence rates, um, levels of hospitalization and death rates, levels of vaccination rates, and presence of variants of concern, along with our local vaccination rate goal of 80%. At all phases, public health will monitor the local prevalence rate and the spread of COVID with reduced restrictions. 
the trigger for introduction of public health intervention in all phases will be two non-related community clusters requiring hospital admission. We are, of course, now in phase one. This phase features continued local uptake of the COVID-19 vaccination and low prevalence rates in Cayman, in the key, sorry, key Cayman travel markets, which has allowed for the introduction of reduced quarantine periods and other travel, travel restrictions. However, the borders remain closed and travel is supposed to be allowed for essential reasons only. Specific aspects of this phase in, includes uh, entry PCR testing being required for all. A negative PCR test result in, uh, is required to exit quarantine. Verifiably certified vaccinated travelers have a five day quarantine period and unverified vaccinated travelers have a 10 day quarantine period and unvaccinated travelers have a 14 day qual um, quarantine period. As of 1st July, government will begin paying for quarantine at government run facilities only for those who are conducting essential travel. Phase two will feature reduced repatriation restrictions and is scheduled to begin on August 9th, 2021. During this phase, we will increase the monitoring of vaccinated travelers. Sorry, we will ease the monitoring of vaccinated travelers by removal of GPS monitoring. This will allow the government to assess local impacts and build capacity to manage increased traveler volumes anticipated with the opening of the borders in phase three. All businesses will be required to mandate sorry, to adhere to safety protocols issued by regulators and industry which comply with the Caribbean Public Health Agency guidelines. In phase three, which is anticipated to begin on September 9th, we plan for a limited introduction of tourism. At that date, we will be beyond the time frame of schools opening, so we'll not be opening our borders at the same time as our children are preparing to go back to school. Also, we are doing this during our traditional slow season with some restrictions, which include a flight slot management system to limit the number of people arriving. This allows for government and the tourism industry to develop capacity for dealing with larger volumes of travelers in preparation for high season. During phase three, our borders will be open to securely verified vaccinated travelers, except for cruise travelers. A Cayman Islands Airport Authority slot management system will manage flight volumes and schedules and medical insurance coverage will be required of inbound travelers. Quarantine will be allowed at all hotels and other tourism accommodations with periodic spot visits for vaccinated persons in quarantine. In phase four, which is scheduled to begin on October 14th, we will remove the requirement to quarantine for all securely verified vaccinated travelers. We anticipate that the rate of local vaccination will be substantially adequate by this time to allow for the safe increase in tourism and relaxation of restrictions. However, during phase four, unvaccinated travelers will continue to be required to apply for entry on the Cayman, on the Travel Cayman portal. Va vaccinated travelers will be required to make a declaration of travel and include their vaccination status on the Travel Cayman portal with a declaration certificate issued and vaccination checked on arrival. Public gathering limits may also be decreased at this time, depending on whether there's any public health risk being demonstrated. Additionally, during phase four, there will be fines mandated for travelers failing to abide by this process and school staff will be required to undergo 
surveillance PCR testing. Further loosening of travel restrictions will come with phase five, when we will allow unvaccinated children younger than the eligible vaccination age to travel with vaccinated adult tourists. Phase five is expected to begin in November, on November 18th. During phase five, unvaccinated children younger than 12 will not be required to quarantine. PCR testing will be required for local unvaccinated children older than five who have tra traveled prior to being allowed to return to school. There will be surveillance of unvaccinated persons by periodic PCR testing. We will first assess the COVID-19 situation on January 27th next year in a local and international context to ter determine when and how to proceed with the further relaxation of restrictions and travel. If the assessment allows, we would begin to welcome all travelers and start the reintroduction of cruise tourism. It is anticipated that at this point, there would no longer be any quarantine restrictions for any travelers, no restrictions on public gathering limits or public transport capacity, and no restrictions on certain business, businesses and operations such as the rental of scuba and snorkeling equipment, use of hookahs, water pipes, etc. As you have seen, this plan takes a phased approach, which allows assessment at each phase. Assessments will be based on medical science and data to indicate to us either to progress or change our plans before we move to the next phase. We must remember that even with this careful and phased reopening approach, there will be risks. As we have done throughout this pandemic, we will manage these risks together in partnership as a community guided by public health. We have to realize that we may reach a juncture where some of the prior restrictions may be reintroduced. We may have to wear masks. There will be regular testing of those on front lines and possibly some dialing back of public health limits. That is all aimed at not recklessly throwing caution to the wind. To date, no country has successfully reopened without having to go back into some form of lockdown or restrictions. Given our patient and careful approach to COVID, we have the opportunity to be the first. As an aside, Sunday, 11th of July, will mark one year since our last community transmission of COVID. I don't know about you guys, but as an aside goes, I think that's one heck of a on the side. <laughs> to reinforce, to bring home the risks of reopening too soon or in the wrong way, just take a look at our fellow overseas territory, the British Virgin Islands. They're now under a nighttime curfew and have closed bars, gyms, and hairdressers from Tuesday in response to a COVID-19 outbreak that took the number of active cases from close to zero to 480 in one week. The BVI government has had to bring in a wide range of new lockdown measures where businesses and restaurants must restrict customer numbers in line with social distancing protocols. We have a chance to once again defy the odds, but that will require the cooperation of the private sector government, and all citizens. This map to reopening may include roadblocks and detours, but this plan gives us all something to work towards. And we have 
a significant degree of confidence in it if all goes well. As we've tried to hammer home time and again, vaccination is the best way to protect yourself, your family, and finally, our community. As we all know, nothing can live and flourish in a vacuum. Your support and engagement are key to the island's reopening strategy. I hope, no, I know we can count on your support and I will welcome your feedback. Nothing is of greater importance to me and my government than the well-being of our people. We have spent weeks deliberating and seeking to strike the right balance and we believe that in this plan we have a roadmap to the safe and successful reopening of our economy to tourism. Being part of this audience today allows you to be the first to have access to our safely national reopening plan. You can download the plan by using the QR code on the screen. The plan will also be published on our official CIG website shortly, which is explore uh, sorry, exploregulf.ky. In closing, thank you for demonstrating amazing endurance to listen through all these lengthy remarks. Um, President Mike, uh, I think you and the Chamber members will see that my government is moving the Cayman Islands in the right direction with a common and shared vision. And realizing that vision includes the participation of all of you. I look forward to continued discussions with you and your membership on ways we can complement each other's efforts for the betterment of our people and our country. Thank you, President Mike. Thank you to the Chamber Council and all members of the Chamber of Commerce for once again hosting this important legislative luncheon. And it has been my distinct honor and privilege to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Premier. Sorry, that's a bit loud. Um, <laughs> voice from God, no. Um, we're going to go into a, a kind of a fireside chat, although there's no fire, there's just water. Um, so President Mike and the Premier will engage in a conversation. I have received some questions from the audience. I appreciate it, but we'll begin with a conversation. I know we are after 2 o'clock, so if you have to leave, I'd ask you to do it quietly and courteously. Thank you. Thank you, Will, and Honorable Premier, thank you very much for that presentation. And again, thank you for doing that here at our, this Chamber event. It certainly means a lot to us as the Chamber that uh, you're participating and sharing this with us here today. So thank you very much for that. Um, before we, I know there'll be many, many questions, I'm sure, on the plan. Um, and obviously there's a lot of detail that still needs to be fleshed out. Um, but one question, actually, maybe before we get into the reopening, is the area of your own ministry of sustainability. And uh, maybe could you add some, some further personal thoughts as to what drove, um, you know, in addition to what you've already talked, mentioned, what drove you to sort of take on that ministry and how do you see it getting some quick wins if there are any out there? Thank you very Testing. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, President Mike. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, I think this has been something that I've observed over time. Um, let's say over the last four or five years, not just regionally, but internationally as an issue um, and a matter that needs to have its own separate ministry. Um, it needs to have, it needs to be aligned with development policy as well. Um, I think everybody knows that we haven't had a development plan in Cayman uh, since 1997, or a revised development plan, I should say. And the view was essentially that 
in order to effectively um, take on a significant task like that um, and to ensure that it reflected um, sustainable development um, objectives and goals, we needed to have a separate ministry that was able to focus on that. Um, I think also I have a lot of energetic um, colleagues who are interested in taking on challenges themselves. Um, and I have always thought that it is better for um, a premier or the leader of the government to have a specific role that perhaps um, is something that gets built um, into a significant ministry as we move along um, and be able to assist my colleagues um, and have sort of have an overarching perspective. Uh, you will know as, as a CEO of your, or president of your company, you need the time to be able to uh, have an overview of everything, to be able to, to think through the strategic perspectives. If you're busy all the time going from, you know, one administrative task to another and, and um, being asked to review this and sign off on that, you don't have any time to do those types of things. Um, so that, that is the type, the, those are the types of issues that, that drove the approach in relation to creating the, the separate ministry. Um, importantly as well is the reality that we have very significant threats from climate change. Being a set of small islands, um, Grand Cayman, the highest point in Grand Cayman is somewhere around close to 70 feet, but the average height above sea level is somewhere around seven feet. And if you take all of the areas that are, that are, um, that have the highest population densities, it's even lower than that. So we have a lot invested in this issue. Um, and we are not going to be um, in any way protected from the, the implications um, and the negative effects of, of climate change. And I think that the longer we take to start addressing these issues and incorporating an approach into our planning and a development approach, which reflects the degree of sustainability and resilience that's needed. Um, you know, we're kicking the can down the road. The cost of addressing issues um, is going to be is, is going to to mount astronomically. So the time is now. Um, I have listened to many of our heads of government colleagues around the Caribbean, who are faced with similar issues. Um, not just in the Caribbean, but many places in the world. There are many cities that have susceptibility to these issues. Uh, we only have to look at Miami or the Florida Keys uh, as, as a clear example or of the types of issues that they're having to deal with and face um, that we will in the not too distant future. And uh, we can learn a lot from each other, um, both regionally and internationally. And these are, these are all factors that I think require us to have a separate ministry that specifically addresses these issues. Quick wins, um, you know, we're not, to, we're not talking about um, something that is going to give somebody something immediately. That's the issue with this. Um, the quick wins is making sure that we move quickly to assess what our risks are to climate change issues and to be able to start implementing policies and standards that help to build resiliency um, for, for five years from now, 10 years from now, 30 years from now. So that's, that's why I think it's a very important and critical approach. Um, it al also allows me, as I said, um, the ability to help um, be a part of the rest of the government as, and assist my colleagues and work with them better um, as they are transitioning into their roles. Thank you, and, and I think you've, one of the key point there is that this whole aspect of climate change and resiliency and sustainability flows through all of the ministries, really. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's key then, that I, I understand where you're coming from. And that's exactly what I've outlined to them. It's, it's, it's across government, just like it's across industries. It's, it's gonna be relevant to all of us. It, these are potentially existential issues, you know, in the extreme, but um, they, they are a significant quality of life issue in the nearer term.
Thank you. Um, I know I'm sure Will's got a bunch of questions lined up, but I have one uh, that I'd just like to, to throw out there in the area of the verif verification of uh, the vaccination certificates and obviously the key challenge that we're going to face with the US right. and how they're... Maybe could you expand on your thoughts on that at this point? Okay. Thanks for that. I really appreciate that. I mean, I've had a lot of... Um, mothers of Caymanian children that were vaccinated in the US having a good scream in my ear about why their kids have to have to have 10 days and can't get five days um, vaccination. You know, I'm totally symp sympathetic and it's a very good question, but it's a question of trying to maintain standards that are that make sense and apply them equally to everybody. We are not we, have, we did not come up with the verifiable vaccine concept to disadvantage anybody that gets vaccinated in the United States. Our hope at the time, which was some weeks ago now, that this was going to quickly evolve from a US perspective into um, uh, a solution. I am still being advised that that, that is going to happen. I can tell you that at this point right now, we can read QR codes from two states. One is California, which most of you will know is a separate country in itself, practically. Um, and maybe not our biggest market at this point, but, um, and Louisiana. Um, I think there is also um, a move which is private sector based between a uh, uh, partnership between technology companies and a number of the, the private sector companies that are engaged in administering the vaccine, which sounds to me will, like it will, it's moving quite fast and it will soon get us, very soon get us to a point where we have QR codes that can be read by our systems here in the same way that we could read the QR code from um, the NHS in the UK um, and indeed um, I think most or at least parts of Europe. So we're, I want to tell you that I'm very, very optimistic, um, but I don't know, I, the, the, the state's approach is very fragmented. The US approach is very fragmented. The federal government says it's not our responsibility. And we have a lot of states that are, the more democratic states are taking the approach of saying, yes, we're going to create a verification system. The GOP, uh, led states, uh, Republican-led states are saying, no, we're not. And you, you can't even ask. Um, Florida is an example of that, which is, happens to be our, you know, our gateway state at this point, um, and largely so. So that's a problem. And you know, we, don't, we don't want, at this point, to have to dial back on our, um, our requirement that we have a verifiable way of, of confirming vaccination um, because of fear that this, that will be taken advantage of. And we only need a few instances um, to get by and we end up having a significant explosion in, in, um, in infections. And we have a BVI situation, for example. The vaccination rate for us is a critical thing that is going to substantially reduce our risk of that sort of thing happening. So we're transitioning from controlling by restriction methods, by mass, by social distancing, to relying more on the vaccination rate. And it, once we get there, all, a lot of those restrictions may decrease. Some may, some may have to be reinstated if, they, if there is some evidence of um, local transmission. Will there be? The answer to that is probably. But if we can get everybody vaccinated that can get vaccinated, the risk of people getting very sick, getting in the hospital, or dying goes down drastically. That's the evidence. That's the data. Absolutely. Um, on a related subject, maybe the flip side of for Caymanians and residents wishing to travel overseas, how, is there any thoughts on how we can make sure our ver va vaccine approval is verifiable? Yes, we're doing that. Um, I don't know the exact timing right now, 
um, perhaps the, I see the health minister over there, um, Minister Turner, I don't know if she's aware of, of exactly the timing on it, but that is imminent. Um, we are going to be able to provide our own app-based QR code so that we can verify to uh, other countries that our people have been vaccinated. Okay, thank you very much. That's, I'm sure that's good news for many people. Will, can I turn to you for a question from the audience? Yes, thank you, President Mike. I guess the first question deals, obviously, most of the questions are dealing with the reopening. So the first one deals with the work permit process and the applications when, we, when you do prepare to reopen. And the question is, um, how will work be restructured or will, does the government provide, will pr provide more resources to work for the processing of work permit applications? Uh, the simple answer is yes. We recognize that there will be logistical challenges around this. And we recognize that um, in, the, in, in, the, in the past, you know, there, there was a perception of a decreased turnaround time with, with work permits. Um, you know, I know all of you, just about all of you, know um, our deputy governor. Mr. Franz Madison. And folks, he's a guy that if you give him a challenge, he doesn't say, uh, I don't know if we can get this done. I'm not sure. He says, yes, of course, we'll make it happen. So our promise to you is that we're going to find a way to make it happen. We will make sure that there are sufficient resources. We will make it happen. But we want you to make it happen as well. We want you to put, faith, gen put forth genuine um, sincere efforts in trying to get Caymanians in some of those positions so you, re you can reduce the challenge we have in dealing with work permits. So another question deals with uh, human rights and whether the government has a position on whether it's really a volunteer um, to be volunteer um, effort to get the vaccination or are you going to begin mandating it Question finished? <laughs> I've summarized it. Okay. Um, at this point, of course, um, we have not considered anything like a mandatory a vaccination for the whole country. Um, we do feel strongly that, that our guest workers, um, in the same way that we test them for uh, tuberculosis or we test them for other types of diseases that are transmissible, um, we can do this, we can require vaccinations as well. Um, we, we do not, as I said, think it is going to be necessary to mandate anything. We're not going to take a Duterte approach um, and <laughs> tell people they either get vaccinated or they leave. I don't know where they're going to go from his country, but um, that's, that's not an approach that that we think is necessary um, and, and not one that we, uh, we feel should be considered at this point. We are very close. I mean, just as a reminder, we are, I think, around 68, 69% now with first shots, and we are at about 64, 65% with second shots. So we are getting very close. We just need a final push to get us to the point of of 80% vaccination so that we satisfy what has been recommended to us by Public Health England as the standard which will give us a sufficient degree of, of herd immunity. That will give us the protections, that will allow us um, to be able to manage if anyone gets sick with our, let's face it, our limited um, hospital facilities to deal with these types of issues. We'll deal with it, another subject, but closely related to Caymanian's first policy that this government has, has, is introducing, is what does, or does the new government have a plan to lower the threshold for procurement requirements to encourage more local purchasing of products and services? Can you repeat the question for me? deals with government procurement uh -huh. 
Government procurement. Procurement, yes, right. government procurement. And whether this government, in keeping with its Caymanian first policies, oh, okay. would be willing to lower the threshold to allow more local companies to qualify for local procurement through government. I think that's, that's something that we're, we're happy to have a look at. But I mean, these things all have to be balanced with ensuring that there's value for money and that um, there is the quality of service and the quality of the product. Um, subject to those types of things being satisfied, I don't see an issue with, with us reviewing uh, our approach um, so that smaller businesses have the ability to participate in the government procurement process. President Mike, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. I think we're, we're now at uh, about 35 minutes over our allotted time. So um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, uh, Will. And I have one, maybe one clarification. I think from the, is it phase five? The last phase is mid-January-ish. Is that the date that we're con earliest we're considering no. cruise passengers coming back? Phase five is November 18th. I think that's phase five. Okay, all right, okay, the, with the, very, the last phase. The last, okay, so that's, that's the point at which we will be assessing where we're at, how things have been going, make sure that there aren't any um, public health concerns which dictate that we, um, you know, we decide how we're going to approach mm -hmm. them. Um, but if, if everything is pointing in the right direction, at that point, we would lift all the other restrictions and allow cruise tourism back in. Um, we've been told by the cruise lines that their plan, uh, I'm not sure if there's been any change recently, uh, but the last time I spoke to Carnival at least, um, their plan, and I, th I imagine it was the same for, for Royal and others, their plan is to have 100% vaccination of their crew and 98 to 100% vaccination of their passengers. Um, if that is the case, um, our vaccination numbers are high um, and we have managed and we don't have any real issues of concern going on, then yes, we can have cruise tourism returning at that point. Because uh, you know that's going to be the equivalent of a massive number of flights landing in Grand Cayman every day. Thank you. And Again, thank you, Premier, for, for being here today and sharing this information with us. I think at this point, I'd like to call up uh, President-elect Shamari uh, to give the vote of thanks. Thank you. I see you all leaving. I'm going to embarrass you if you get up from your seats. I'm going to start calling names. but. Um, just want to say that I saw that sustainability was definitely a topic um, today. And just to bring some balance to it, President Mike was speaking about England actually winning that game. But um, did you see that you all were actually fined for cheating with a laser in the goalkeepers? Okay. okay. I just wanted to bring some balance to the fact that it was actually a laser to the goalkeeper's eyes that caused that victory. And me being a sports fan, I'm seeing a theme, you know, Tom Brady used to play for New England, and we all know that story about how they, you know, massage the rules to win. It's interesting that, that England and New England are massaging the rules, but that's okay. We'll see what happens on Sunday. Um, the Chamber Council and staff would like to acknowledge and thank everyone for attending today's legislative luncheon. We hope that you enjoyed your lunch and the interactions with your elected leaders and public servants. It's great to see so many members here actually supporting this event. We'd like to thank His Excellency the Governor, the Premier, Cabinet Ministers, public servants for continuing to support this event by sitting down for lunch with us. Chamber members appreciate your willingness to engage with them in this annual event and we hope you'll find this interaction as enjoyable as we all do. And my apologies to Minister Turner to having to bear with me throughout the lunch whispering in her ear, not sweet nothings, but actually <laughs> having conversation about, you know, where the country is actually going. We'd also like to thank DART for serving as our VIP sponsor. Your contributions to this event, not only financially, but providing us with an update in your activities and plans. 
and also providing us insight into your development plans and priorities. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jackie and the DART team. We truly appreciate your support. And also to mention that recently I was speaking about um, mangoes and cakes and the fact that you know you're successful when in the Cayman Islands and in context of Health City, the hospital's um, cafeteria went from having onesie twosies of mangoes to an abundance of mangoes from their patients bringing them in for the doctors. And I just want to say that DART really must love you all because they're not giving you mangoes, they're actually giving you trees. <laughs> so I hope there's a mango tree in there that's saved for me. One, that's for me, I will take that one. We'd like to acknowledge the 28 corporate members who reserved a table at this event. Some of your banners are displayed around the room and represents the diversity of the Chamber's membership in the various industry sectors. Thanks for your contributions and support as always. We'd also like to thank the small businesses who took the time to attend today. Since more than 65% of Chamber members are small business owners, we appreciate the challenges that you face and in finding the time and resources to come here today. The Kimpton team has been truly amazing. Kelly, Adam, and the Banquet team have worked to make this event a success. We enjoy working with them and look forward to more events in the future. Special thanks to the media for covering today's event. Your live coverage enabled the community to hear the important messages that were shared today. We're truly grateful, and you know it's been successful because right as the reopening plan went up, my phone started pinging because people outside of here were sending me the reopening plan because they thought they were giving me some news, but that's great. <laughs> Lastly, we would like to thank the Chamber of Commerce team for organizing this event on short notice. As we know, there's lots of moving parts with organizing an event to this magnitude, and the Chamber team, ably led by Will Panu, worked diligently to ensure that everything ran as smoothly as possible Thank you, Will, and I want to thank you all for taking the time. It was, what, two hours and a half of coming here, listening, and actually getting all of the information we had to give. I thank you all, I thank you all, and I bid you farewell. Now leave, now you may leave.